Hi, and welcome to Money Matters. I'm Allison Hinson. Today we're going to be talking about FAFSA, which is a mouthful, and it's the form that you need to complete in order to get money for college. And our guest today is Jessica Whittier, and she is with the Finance Authority of Maine. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you for having me. So you are a college access counselor, so you basically go around and help people understand FAFSA. Absolutely. So there are three of us at FAME. We work throughout the state of Maine, so I cover the bottom third of the state. So we go into the schools and we talk about the free application for federal student aid. So that's what FAFSA is. And I like the first word. It's free. It's so free. it's free application for financial student aid. For federal student federal, aid. Federal. Federal yes, student absolutely. aid. Absolutely. So I've heard that this is a form that people just dread filling out, which is why we wanted to do a show on it, because I've heard that this is kind of a hurdle that people face when, they're, when they themselves are thinking about going back to college or they're trying to uh, fill out these forms to get their kids into college. Right, so for a lot of families, that getting that FAFSA completed can sometimes be that barrier that, um, that keeps them from accessing college. So we go out and we try to promote. That the FAFSA is actually a lot easier than people think it is. So I, it's a myth out there I, that it it's hard? It is absolutely <laughs> a myth. And I know for people who have maybe filled it out in the past, so in, um, you know, back when I was heading off to school and my parents were filling out the FAFSA for me, it was all on paper and it was those little bubble sheets that you oh, had yeah, to fill yeah. in. Um, and it's moved online and over the years it's gotten easier and easier. Um, the federal government has done a really good job at reducing the number of questions on the form and they've also done a good job uh, they've um, uh, employed skip logic which means if you answer a question that says I'm not married I'm single it's not gonna go and ask you questions about your spouse so it's gonna understand those things and make it a little shorter for you now is that the only way to do it on computer just going back to what if I don't have access to a computer is there a way to do this on paper still there is a way to do it on paper, and you can, again, maybe through your local library or for, uh, through your school, get access to that paper form. But I would suggest that this be maybe the one time that you go and find a computer that you can use because it will be much easier for you if you do it online. It will save you some steps, and it will get processed uh, more quickly. So it is to a family's advantage to complete the FAFSA online. And 99% of FAFSAs are completed online today. So it's a f um, free form. Is there any place, if I go online and Google FAFSA, is there somebody who's going to charge me for filling out this form? Right. So you want to make sure that when you are filling out the FAFSA, you are on uh, fafsa.gov or fafsa.ed.gov. It needs to have that .gov at the end of the website uh, link. There are other websites out there. I'm not going to tell you what they are because I don't want somebody going <laughs> and, and, and looking them up, but they are out there and you can end up on these other websites. So if you Google FAFSA in that ser those search engine results, some of those sites will come up before fafsa.gov. If you click on them, you'll go to the website. It's going to look very legitimate. It's going to look like uh, a, a site that would provide these services. You're going to answer all the questions on the FAFSA, and it's not until the end, once you've done all the work, that it says, oh, by the way, all we need is your credit card and $75 to $300, and we'll process Ooh. the form for you. And that's when you know, oh, wait a minute, I'm in the wrong site because you know Jessica Whittier told me it was free. <laughs> um, and, <that's> <laughs> and, and free. I mean, I mean, it, it is free. That's the first word in this. So let's step back. I Let's pretend I've got a kid who's going into college or I myself am thinking about going to college. When do I fill out this form? Do I fill this out before I start looking at colleges? Do I fill it out when I'm applying for colleges? I mean, when, when in this process do I even start thinking that I've got to fill out this form? So students are typically going to fill out their FAFSA the year prior to their attending college. So if they're planning to start college in fall of 2017, so September of 2017, they're going to want to fill out that form in that, that year before. So the FAFSA becomes available on October 1st each year. So that's something new. If families have done it in the past, it used to not be available until January 1st. But uh, going forward, it will always be available on October 1st. So a student's senior year of high school, they can fill it out on October 1st. That's, so basically, I go through summer, my kid has their last 
summer that they're in high school, and then boom, we start looking at filling out this form. So this form is, it can start being filled out before even college applications are due. Absolutely, and we certainly saw that this year. Lots of students were getting this FAFSA done, and then starting to work on their their um, college applications as well. Does it make any difference if I'm, if I'm like on this October 1st, will I or my kid get more money? Does the timing have anything to do with it? You know, it, uh, it is best to have it done as quickly as you possibly can. Um, we'll talk in a minute about financial aid filing deadlines for colleges, but the sooner you fill it out, often the more financial aid you could be eligible for. So the sooner the better. So when's the last absolute date? If, if, I, if the early bird gets the worm on October 1st right. and I get this done, when's the last date that I can file this and still get money? Right, so that's a little, uh, it, it's a more confusing answer than you might think, but in reality, a student could go to college, pay for it as they go, and as long as they filled out that FAFSA before June, when they're finishing up that first year of college, they could potentially get some financial aid to back pay. <laughs> um, so that's a little confusing. So there's no clear end date, but there's a very clear start date. If Absolutely. October 1st. So now, obviously, we're in January. We're past October 1st. Do I still have incentive to fill it out? Absolutely, so many colleges, most colleges in the United States have financial aid filing deadlines. So they have a date that they want your form done by. It's different for each college, so when you're doing your research about colleges, when you're looking at you know, what college uh, has the program I want, and you know the dorms or the sports or all uh -huh. of those other college choice pieces, you should also be checking out a college's financial aid webpage to find out when their financial aid filing deadline is, and exactly what forms they want from you. So every college in the country wants that FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. Some colleges have their own form as well, like a supplemental one page where they might ask a couple questions. And again, you can find that on their website. And then 250 colleges in the country want the CSS profile. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a lot of letters, CSS profile, CSS. but that's only for a certain number that's of colleges. That's only for a small number of colleges. In Maine, we only have three, Colby, Bates, and Bowdoin. So the profile is a little bit more challenging, uh, has a few more parts and pieces, and does have a cost. So that is different from the FAFSA. Um, so if you find you have a college that wants that profile, uh, but you shouldn't let that worry you, visit the profile website, get some more information, and get that done as well. But you want to get it done, all those forms done, by the college's financial aid filing deadline because colleges that have deadlines will give away most of their money by the for, to the students who apply by that deadline. So if you have a college that has a January 1st financial aid filing deadline, that college is taking all of the students who have applied to their college, been accepted to their college and completed the financial aid form on time and they're taking all of the money that they have mm -hmm. at their discretion and it all goes out the door on that date. So if you're late at filling out forms, this is the one form or maybe two, what was that called? The CSS? The CSS, the CSS profile. So if you visit cssprofile.org um, uh, but it's the uh, college board, the same folks that gave us the SAT created the CSS profile. So it is typically required at colleges that have um, more, uh, they're more selective colleges, okay. but also colleges that have more money to give away. So that's why they are asking for the profile. So when you think of Colby, Bates, and Bowdoin, all colleges that meet uh, you know, the, just about 100% of need, that give students all the money they need uh, to go to college, they want to get a really clear picture of your family's financial situation, so they ask more questions, so the profile is a little more involved. So the FAFSA form, it basically exists to figure out how much money that I, as an individual or a parent, has, so they can figure out how much financial aid I should get. Is that true? Right. So the whole point of filling out the FAFSA is to get one number. It is called your EFC your expected family contribution. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for that EFC so that they have an idea of um, how much your family can afford to pay for college. When you complete the FAFSA form, you're going to be able to list the colleges that you want, that you're considering, mm -hmm. and it's going to send that information to all of those colleges. So that's what they send is that, that number, that how much, how much the federal government thinks your family can pay for college. So 
it's October 1st, I'm on top of this. So I sit down at the computer okay. and I can access the FAFSA through famemain.com. You can absolutely go through our website or go directly to fafsa.gov. So I sit down, I'm at the kitchen table, I sit down, I'm ready to fill this out to get my money. And what forms or what information do I need to fill this out? Sure. So um, one of the first things before you even sit down to fill out the FAFSA, so when you're in, just in the process of doing your research, most families should be uh, getting their F. S-A-I-D's. I know lots of acronyms. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you can tell it's all government things. So, it absolutely is. so actually there's a step before October 1st. Right. So prior to filling out your, your FAFSA form, you want to get an ID. So every student that's going to complete the form needs an ID. And if they are a dependent student, so if they are dependents of their parents, um, for financial aid purposes, that's just about any student under the age of 24 is going to be considered a dependent of their parents. Um, so if they are a dependent student, you need a, an ID for the student and at least one ID for a parent in the household. So before October 1st, I go, it's called an F FSA ID. An FSA ID, yes. Where do I get this ID from? Um, FSAID.ed.gov. <laughs> so again, visit our website at famemain.com and we have it all written out for you, the, all the steps and all the information that you'll need. And we have short videos that you can watch to help you through as well. So the first step before October 1st is I, and assuming that I'm paying for my child, we both need to get these IDs. You do. And it's a little trickier. So one of the, the challenges that I think we've had, the FSA ID, the federal government has gone out of its way to make them very robust. The security uh, on the IDs is very strong because of that, and, and it should be because- I, I was, I'm happy to know that the ID, because I don't, this is my financial information we're talking about. I don't want people accessing it. Absolutely, so you want to make sure that this, uh, that they, they wanted to make sure that the ID was very secure. So they created all these kind of safeguards. But what that has done is it's made the process of getting the ID a little challenging for a lot of people. So it, it's an online form, you're, you know, putting in a username, creating a username, creating a password. But unlike most passwords that need just a few, um, maybe an uppercase, a capital, or a- And a uh, letter, right, or maybe a special a number. character. Right, so this one needs like four different things in that. So most passwords that somebody might use on a regular basis are not gonna be, you know, either not gonna be able to use it in here. And so because of that, a lot of people will fill out these forms and forget what they filled in. So I would suggest if you are, when you are filling out the application online for your ID, that you write everything down. And if you visit our website at famemain.com, we have a worksheet that you can print out and you can write everything down as you go. And you want to keep that form someplace safe. So mm -hmm. with your tax documents, um, again, this is your, this is you, this is your, uh, security password uh -huh. to get into these accounts. So you don't want anybody else having access to this. You don't want it at the bottom of a school bag. <laughs> so you want- <laughs> That would never happen, would it? No, never. Um, so you want to keep it someplace safe, but students are going to have to use that ID every year. So you don't- So this is an ID that I'm going to keep over and over again. So you fill out the FAFSA every year a student goes to college. So you fill it out their senior year of high school to cover their freshman year of college. You fill it out their freshman year of college to cover their sophomore and their sophomore to cover their junior and on and on. So you need to use this on a regular basis. And if they are taking out any federal student loans, it's also the ID they're going to use to access information about their student loans and maybe make online payments and things like that. So. I go to the, I get my FSA ID, and it sounds like I better really go and print out that form from famemain.com and, and fill this out. And you're right, put it in a place, A, where it's secure, and B, where I'm going to remember that I put it. Right. Absolutely. So I get my ID all set up, my ID, my kid's ID. Now, as a parent, if I have more than one kid, I assume I can always use the same ID. I don't have to change IDs every time I have a you know, send a kid to college. Right, so the parent's ID stays the same. So your ID is your ID. Your students will each need their own ID, so they can't use the same ID. The other thing about the IDs is that it needs, it requires an email address. And you wouldn't think that's a big deal, except- No, I, that, that doesn't seem like a big deal. <laughs> um, they need to be separate, they can't, you cannot share the same email address. So if you're creating uh, an ID for yourself, and then you say, well, while I'm on here, I'll just go ahead and create an ID for my daughter, um, 
you can't use your email address again. Uh, and actually, we suggest that you don't create one for your daughter, that you make sure that your daughter is creating one for herself and she's there as well. So trying not to create them for other people. You can't use the same email address. We also don't suggest that you use the school email address. So if you I was just going to ask because kids get email addresses these days for, from the school, and that tends to be their default. Right. So if you're a Biddeford High student and you have a, a Biddeford email address, you want to uh, potentially not use that email because after you graduate, Biddeford's going to shut down that email account. And you're away at college, and when it comes time for you to access the FAFSA again to get financial aid to cover your sophomore year, now that email doesn't work any longer. So you want to use an email that you're going to have access to when you're in college. It's a great time if you don't already have a professional looking uh, email address, so something like first name, last name, you know, at Gmail or Hotmail or whatever you want to use, now's the time to do it. Use that on your college applications, use that on your financial aid forms. That's a lot of information to remember. Absolutely. <laughs> Is there some place on famemain.com that's going to give me tips? Sure. So if you go to famemain.com and go to the education section of our website, um, all of the stuff I'm talking about today, as well as tons of other information, can be found on there. We do have some short videos that you can watch as well. You can also go to our publications page, um, and we have this Paying for College um, magazine, brochure, booklet, and you can actually request that to be mailed to you. So you can request that. It's free right on our website. Or chances are, if you're a student, if you have a high school student, you can just stop by the guidance office in your school and they'll have a copy of it uh, that you can access as well. So I get through the process of getting my ID. So my ID is set up, my kid's ID is set up. I go to start FAFSA. What do I need for that? I mean, is this going to be like days of digging through stuff, trying to find... Hopefully not. <laughs> that, that's the right answer. <laughs> right. Because I remember this, and, and again, when I went to college, it was paper, but I remember it being, oh, my mother trying to find all this information. Is that what it's going to be like? Am I going to feel like I have to dig through stuff? So the pieces that most families are going to need when they're filling out the form, so once they have their FSA ID, obviously they'll, they'll need that. Um, You'll need things like student's name and date I've of birth, got that. right? Got that. Address, social security number, and although you might say, "Oh, I, yeah, we've totally I, got I, that," I have that. Right. You want to make sure it is the right social security number. So that's something you really do want to be careful about. A lot of times for high school seniors, it's one of the first times they're using that number, you know, for anything practical. And a lot of times, I, parents mix them up. So if, especially if you have more than one child, you might put Johnny's <laughs> social security number on Sally's. Mm -hmm. FAFSA form and now we're really in a tough spot because that's one of the um, the changes that's hard to make on the FAFSA is if you mess up on the social security number. So make sure that you're double checking that that, that number is correct. So pull out the actual social security actual card, card and look at it. The other piece that you're going to need is some some tax information and your W-2s. So if you're filling out the 2017-2018 FAFSA, so the 17-18 FAFSA would be for students who are graduating from high school in 26, sorry, 2017, 2017. and planning to begin college in September of 2017, that's going to require their 2015 tax information. Because I don't have my tax information yet. It's January. I, right. I, don't, I, don't, have, I don't even have my W-2s yet. So I have to go back another year. Correct. So I, I have my tax stuff. I mean, I again, it's something that I know where it is. I have, I keep my W-2s. Is that really all I need? Is it, I, I just kind of go through and make sure I copy the stuff correctly from my tax form into the computer? For the most part, the other piece that you'll need, is, it is going to ask about your assets. Um, so you do also want to know how much you have in the bank. So money in the bank, or if you have any mutual funds or investments and things like that. So maybe want, that's where it gets a little trickier. Yeah. If you what, have, well, what if I have a 401k with my company? Do I have to know what the balance of that is? You do not. So when it comes to the FAFSA, there are some things that they're looking at and some things they are not. So what is it looking at? The FAFSA is going to ask questions about income. So parent income and student income. Parent income plays the largest role in this process. So when it comes to awarding financial aid, the higher the parent's income, typically the lower the financial aid that a student is going to be eligible for. So you make more money, you pay more money for college. Right. 
That makes sense. Right. And so student income is just a little bit different. Students can actually earn $6,000 a year, and that first 6,000 the federal government is not even looking at. So it's only anything over 6,000 where they'll start looking. What if I make a lot of money? Mm -hmm. So it's I on my 2015 tax form, it shows I made a ton of money, but hey, I'm a big spender and I've got a big mortgage payment, I'm driving fancy cars, and we just bought the lake house. Won't they give me a break on that? They will not, so. But, but I'm spending all my money. Absolutely, so, but what the federal government will say is that was your choice. So it was your choice to have a larger mortgage, it was your choice to buy a bigger car or a lake house. Um, and that's great for you uh, on your, your life, but it's, you still need to come up with it. There's, you are still responsible for paying for your student to go to college. Um, so there are some things, however, when it's not your choice, so that you might be able to get some leeway on, and those would be things like unusual medical expenses is a regular one, or loss of income. So, so if I lose my job, so what if I fill out the form October 1st, and I get it all in because I'm good at these deadlines, and October 15th I lose my job, and all of a sudden, I'm look, you know, my 2015 taxes, which were done when I had a job, I'm looking like I'm doing great, and all of a sudden, oh, not so great right now. Right, so that's a special circumstance. So that is absolutely something you want to call your colleges and let them know. So if you're applying to five colleges, you want to give them each their financial aid offices a call and let them know about your special circumstance. In some cases, they may have a form they want you to fill out or they may just take some information from you. But based on the information they take, they can use their professional judgment to reassess your financial aid eligibility and potentially award you more. So I can't change my FAFSA, but I can plea to each of the colleges that I've applied for, that my child has applied for. That is exactly the so case. So I fill out this form, and it sounds like the information needed to fill out the form is easily available. It is, and in fact, there's also a tool on the FAFSA called uh, the IRS Data Retrieval. So for a lot of families, even though you have those tax forms right there to potentially add a few pieces into the FAFSA, you can actually pull most of the needed financial information directly from the IRS through the FAFSA application. So it'll take you to the IRS website, it'll show you what you filed on your taxes for the year that they're asking for, and it will pull that information right into your FAFSA form and put all the right numbers in all the right places for you. Which sounds convenient, but that kind of scares me. Which is why the FSA ID is so important for it to be so secure. Um, so they've really created a lot of safeguards to make sure that that process and that information is secure when that transfer is done. So in a perfect world, I go in, I create my FSA ID, I go to the FAFSA, I hit the little button, and whoop, all my tax stuff comes in. In a perfect world, then what happens? Do I hit send and all of my data goes to all the colleges that I or my child are interested in? Right, so you'll put in basic information, demographic information, you'll put in income information. You'll also put in asset information. I do wanna just touch on that really quickly. When, it t when they talk about assets, a lot of times families worry about yeah, their I mean, assets. Uh, are they gonna count my house? Am, I mean, am I gonna have to go through grandma's old jewelry? And Right, you know. so when it comes to the FAFSA, uh, there are three things they are not looking at when it comes to assets. Assets, they do not want to know about your qualified retirement accounts. So that 401k, 403b, IRAs, that. none of that. Um, you're, you're not going to report any of that inside your FAFSA. They do not want you draining. The federal government doesn't want you draining your retirement account to pay for your student to go to college. They, you are also not going to include your primary residence, so the home you live in. Again, they don't want you taking out second mortgages, selling your house to pay for your child to go to college. They will also not be looking at any small business assets. So if you own a small business, a family farm, uh -huh. um, as long as you own more than 50% of it and you employ fewer than 100 people, they're not looking at, at any of that as well. So what they are looking at is your bank account, checking savings, mutual funds, investments that are not qualified retirement accounts. If you own a second home, that lake house uh, will affect your that, financial okay. aid eligibility. It actually, uh, not only are you paying a mortgage on it, but it's, it may hurt too. Any, any of the equity in it will have to be included in your FAFSA. And if you own a large business, you'll include those business assets as well. 
as I go through this form, perfect world, I don't make any mistakes. Great. Last thing I checked, I wasn't living in the perfect world and I do make mistakes. So what happens when I'm filling out this form, I either can't figure out how to fill it out, I made a mistake after I hit send, I don't understand what anybody's looking, what do I do? Right. So first, while you're filling out the form, if you ever have a question uh, while you're filling it out and you're nervous, you're uncomfortable, mm -hmm. I would say first, um, as you're filling it out on the right hand side, each question has some tips. So kind of read those tips as you go along to get that extra help. And then uh, if you still have questions, certainly give us a call. So call us at FAME and we, our customer service team Monday through Friday can help answer any of the questions that you have. Or if it's after hours, there is a, a phone number you can, call, you can use to call FAFSA. Um, so let's say you get it done and you press submit. Bing, and Bing. I'm all psyched. Right. And, uh, and then you go, oh, wait a minute, I just found this other you know, uh, investment or this other, you know, asset that I need to add that I forgot to add, or I know I put something in wrong. At that point, it does, the FAFSA does lock you out for about one to three days while it processes. So there's a short period of time where you can't go make a correction. So I've certainly said so that's my panic time. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so I made a mistake. I lied to the government. That's certainly, I've, I've completed FAFSAs with families before and it's that moment that they press enter and they're, we're saying goodbye and they go, oh, wait a minute, I made, I needed to add this and we are locked out for just, a, you know, for that mm -hmm. one to three days. But after that, they can log back into their FAFSA account and they can make a correction. And you can actually make 25 corrections to oh, your good. FAFSA. So oh, yes. I can make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> a lot of mistakes. You can go back in and make some changes. Um, so when you press enter uh, and the FAFSA gets, is processed, it's going to be sent to all of the schools that you listed on the form. Every time you make a correction, those schools will get an update. So they'll get the notification that you made a correction and they'll get the new information. So. Just to wrap up, I fill out the FSA ID, I fill out my FAFSA form, and if I want to make it really easy, I just hit a button and all my information from my taxes come in, and then it's pretty much done. It is. For most families, they can have the FAFSA done in less than 30 minutes, um, so it can be a wow, pretty quick process. Wow, that's, that's great. Well, thank you for coming and sharing that, because that just, for me, I see that yeah, there's some stuff I should think about, but as long as I'm keeping on top of the deadlines, it sounds like it could be a relatively easy process, and Fame Maine is there to help if I have questions. We are. Well, great. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you for watching another episode of Money Matters. I'm Allison Hinson, and I hope that after listening to this, you'll go on and look at the FAFSA process and give Fame Maine a call if you have any questions. Thank you, and have a great week.